I would like to uh, say that I hope all of you are doing well and that your families are also not affected by the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we live in very, very difficult times right now. No one really knows how all of this is going to shake out over the next few months. But uh, just let me say I really wish all of you well and uh, I hope that uh, you'll be able to get through the next uh, few months uh, successfully without adverse consequences either for you or your families. What I've done today is to try and give you my lecture uh, by uh, a video camera that I have uh, and also using my PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm recording this and I'm going to then post it on Canvas for all of you to see. Um, as the first slide uh, indicates, uh, the learning objectives of the lecture are basically to, for me to give you a, an opportunity to understand a bit more about trade agreements, what their purpose is, uh, what the uh, overt uh, rationale is for them uh, by those who support them. Uh, and then I want to move on to talk a little bit about the history of trade agreements since World War II. Uh, and then uh, move forward to looking at some of the key elements of trade agreements, that is to say what they contain. Uh, and that's going to encompass both uh, the major trade agreements that affect Canada, particularly the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA, uh, but also, uh, more importantly for global health, the World Trade Organization agreements. And then I'm going to provide uh, at least my assessment of the impact of these agreements uh, on Canada and also internationally. Uh, and uh, in particular to have a look at some of the impacts on developing countries. So um, that's a screenshot of a book that I did with Duncan Cameron at Finn many years ago in the big debate about the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and I think this was published in 1987 which tells you how old I am. Um, and as you can see it also contains a certain view of the consequence of the agreement between Canada and the US uh, and uh, the little beaver seemed not to be doing too well in this particular cartoon which we got from Terry Mosher, who, uh, whose name is on the bottom right there, he uses as his cartoonist name, Aislin. We also had some very distinguished people in this book, actually. Margaret Atwood, for example, uh, did uh, a nice piece for us on uh, culture and free trade and her worries about that. And this is a, another screenshot of a more recent book, not that more recent, however, 1993, looking at NAFTA uh, and education that I did with the uh, research director of the BC Teachers Federation uh, and we were looking particularly at how NAFTA might affect public education in Mexico uh, and in Canada and the US and I found this very interesting because it gave me an opportunity to learn a little bit about how Mexican education uh, actually worked uh, and what some of the issues were. So enough of me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the um, official purpose of free trade agreements. Uh, and uh, this is what you hear constantly in the media uh, as to why they are beneficial and why we should support them. Um, and that official explanation is essentially that um, we need these trade agreements to reduce barriers to trade such as tariffs uh, and also to reduce uh, government regulation which is normally uh, described in the context of what's called protectionism, that is governments uh, sheltering certain industries or certain sectors of the economy uh, from uh, the possibility of competition from um, companies or investors from other parts of the world. The early trade agreements, uh, and we go back here to Adam Smith and Ricardo and so on, they were uh, based on the uh, neoclassical uh, economic assumption that basically expanding markets, uh, reducing uh, barriers to trade in the form of government regulation, uh, and uh, in general allowing markets to uh, determine how resources would be allocated in economies, that, that uh, doing this would actually uh, improve economic efficiency, uh, would provide people with a better choice uh, and price for a whole range of goods and services, 
uh, and would uh, stimulate economic activity and, and uh, uh, entrepreneurial activity on the part of all those market participants. Uh, and the big problem that was seen even for uh, Ricardo and, and Smith was that at the time governments were engaged in a lot of protectionist activities that privileged certain uh, parts of their society at the expense of the majority. And so neoclassical economics very much based on, on uh, Ricardo and uh, on Smith. Uh, I don't have time to go into their views in detail but uh, that is uh, one of the key sort of uh, driving forces uh, in terms of uh, trade agreements. And let me just say one other thing. Ricardo's concept of um, the way in which uh, comparative advantage uh, worked out internationally was and is an important component of why many economists still support trade agreements. And Ricardo's view here very simply was that uh, trade between countries would encourage each country to specialize in those areas where it was most efficient or most productive. And his illustration at the time was trade between um, Great Britain and uh, Portugal in which uh, the uh, Portuguese were very efficient at making wine, uh, the British were very good at making textiles given their manufacturing capacity, and hence uh, trade agreements, uh, not trade agreements, but rather international trade between these countries would encourage Britain to make more textiles and less wine, Portugal to make more wine and less textiles, and both of them would benefit from the resulting efficiencies that would be generated. Uh, so uh, this uh, is uh, an important uh, background to understanding the uh, hold, as it were, that uh, the whole idea of trade agreements has on the economics profession. So what's the official purpose of current trade agreements? Uh, well, as I said, it is to reduce barriers to trade such as tariffs and, and regulations. Uh, and uh, the uh, trade agreements that we see now, uh, some of the background uh, goes back to the uh, action of the Great Depression of the 1930s. Uh, and uh, at that time what happened was that uh, you had uh, governments uh, raising tariffs to protect their industries after the stock market crash in 1929. Uh, the U.S. did that with the Smoot-Hawley uh, Harley, uh, legislation. Other countries followed suit. The consequence being that trade collapsed basically globally during the 1930s. And what was learned from this by many economists was that uh, allowing trade barriers uh, to be raised was highly detrimental to world trade and to the people who uh, benefited from world trade. And the goal should be to try and lower tariffs and uh, keep uh, world trade from being stifled by protectionist measures. Um, so moving forward a little bit to World War II, um, during the war there was, uh, uh, towards the end of the war when it was clear that the U.S., Britain and uh, Canada and other uh, of the uh, victor countries were going to win, there was a, a major meeting in New Hampshire in Bretton Woods at which uh, they mapped out the uh, future uh, of uh, the world's trading system. And this is a, a, the meeting at which uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, Keynes rather, from Britain um, and Dexter White from the U.S. Uh, laid out uh, several big concepts. One was to establish the, the uh, International uh, Trade Organization, uh, the I ITA as it was called then. Um, another was to set up the um, uh, World Bank and a third was to set up the IMF. Uh, now the International Trade uh, Organization, the ITO, was actually never established. The U.S. was opposed to it, but one component of it was called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, and it dealt only with trade in goods, and it didn't have a significant institutional structure, uh, rather the way in which uh, countries were to be disciplined to lower tariffs and keep them low was through the uh, introduction of trade sanctions to countries that failed to honor their GATT commitments. Now the GATT was negotiated in 1947. Uh, as I said, the purpose was to reduce tariffs on goods and to stop the uh, re-emergence of protectionism in the period after World War II. Uh, 
The GATT uh, expanded both in terms of the number of countries involved and also in terms of the areas of goods that were covered. And that happened through a number of what are called rounds of negotiations. Um, the Annecy round, the um, Geneva round, the Kennedy round, and so on. Uh, and uh, the last round was called the Uruguay round, which started uh, in the early 1980s. And by that time, GATT had actually been quite successful in lowering uh, tariffs uh, and other non-tariff uh, restrictions on trade uh, for most of the member countries of the GATT. Um, so that's the GATT history, very important, but remember the focus was on lowering tariffs. Um, the reality of trade agreements that have been negotiated since the GATT and since the basically the uh, mid-1980s uh, is really quite different. Um, tariffs have been very low since the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, on many goods, they're zero, uh, and uh, with the exception of um, a number of developing countries where they still had high tariffs. For most of the industrialized or developed countries, tariffs were not a major economic issue by the uh, mid or late 1980s. Um, but for a variety of reasons having to do with the emergence of neoliberalism and Thatcher, uh, uh, Helmut Kohl in Germany, Brian Mulroney in Canada, and most importantly, Ronald Reagan in the United States. Um, trade agreements took a very different turn, uh, and they became agreements that were really designed to implement the sort of neoliberal approach to managing the global economy. Uh, and that involved critically of shaping the public policy choices of governments. Uh, and in doing so, the agreements uh, now place a whole range of new constraints uh, on what governments are able to do in a variety of public policy areas. Uh, other, other, another way of saying this is basically they've imposed a, a certain kind of straitjacket on a variety of public policy choices and options. And this is the key message I want to give to you. Current trade agreements are not about lowering tariffs. They are instead about shaping the public policy choices that governments can make. They are fundamentally now about public policy. So how are they packaged? Uh, well, um, the uh, arguments about uh, lowering tariffs, of course, are, are ones that uh, have a lot of uh, support uh, and uh, in many cases understandable support. Um, but what happened in the 1980s was that uh, the content of trade agreements beyond the GATT uh, was uh, restructured such that a whole range of public policy issues were in included. Um, and as I said earlier, these are designed basically to impose a neoliberal economic framework on the global economy. Um, and in particular, they're designed to limit in a permanent way various policy options that governments might otherwise to choose. Uh, and these are policy options that would be different from, for example, the kinds of policies that uh, investors might choose to, to have implemented, uh, or policies that would limit the operation of the global economic market. So basically we've seen this, what I describe in the slide as bait and switch. Uh, on the one hand, people are being told the purpose is to lower trade barriers, uh, which are understood normally as tariffs. In reality, they are about public policy. Uh, and in that regard, they are also about limiting democratic choices of governments, because they place major hurdles or barriers on what governments are able to do. Uh, and uh, maybe to say this a bit more strongly, they um, have established a new unaccountable form of global governance based on these neoliberal principles, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what are some of these features of uh, post-mid-1980 uh, free trade agreements? One is the uh, privileging of markets over public interest. Um, the assumption is that uh, the global economy will be um, uh, managed in a way that protects uh, market access and the right of markets or, or market participants to invest where they please, uh, to uh, trade as they wish, uh, with minimal 
uh, government oversight by any of the major uh, uh, developed uh, governments or, for that matter, uh, developing country governments as well. Um, these agreements have, uh, in terms of their outcomes, privileged some countries at the expense of others and created what we would describe as winners or losers. Uh, they've taken away many government policy tools. Um, in the area of pharmaceuticals and other uh, intellectual property, they've created private monopolies uh, by establishing what are referred to as intellectual property rights, and they cover uh, trademarks, uh, they cover uh, patents, uh, they cover copyrights, and so on. All of these have been brought together, uh, as the uh, Drahos uh, videos will show you, uh, into this package called intellectual property right, rights, which is a term that really has only emerged uh, in starting very early in the 1970s. So it's a very new concept. We used to deal with these uh, separate uh, entities, uh, uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights as separate uh, components, um, and not seen as a, a, a package of intellectual property rights, but they are included in the agreements uh, under that rubric. Um, the agreements also provide very strong protection for investors uh, uh, by limiting what governments can do to regulate uh, investor activities, particularly in the area of the environment. Um, and one of the big consequences of this is that when you reduce government ability to regulate their economies, to tax and so on, um, the market uh, has resulted in a dramatic increase in inequality, which we have covered quite extensively in earlier parts of the course, particularly with the work of Thomas Piketty and his colleagues. So um, how have they shaped health policy? Let's have a quick look at that. Well, in terms of uh, pharmaceuticals, trade agreements um, provide lengthy patent protection to the multinational pharmaceutical industry, which is based almost exclusively uh, in the major developing countries, primarily the US uh, and Europe. Uh, and uh, again, as Drahaus points out, I think quite rightly, um, when you give a lengthy patent protection, namely a minimum of 20 years, to the multinational pharmaceutical industry, this dramatically increases their ability to raise prices and keep them high during the duration of the patent. Uh, and uh, that has huge impacts in terms of access to medicine. Um, other uh, components of these agreements uh, that affect both Canada and developing countries, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they protect foreign investments, including investments in the health sector. So they're not just dealing with foreign investments in, say, manufacturing or resources, also in health. They are based on uh, the view that uh, services and, and uh, Various programs are better ser uh, served or better provided uh, by the private sector, by the market, and therefore they encourage privatization uh, across a wide range of economic activities, including health services. Um, they promote tax cuts and basically reducing the size and role of governments uh, in economic uh, regulation. Um, they limit the expansion of public health insurance, uh, and we'll get back to that point a little bit uh, more uh, with respect to Canada. But uh, for many developing countries, uh, uh, um, signing on to trade agreements uh, through the WTO uh, uh, has uh, resulted in uh, uh, clear limits on their ability to expand public health insurance because, of course, uh, expanding public health insurance means pushing private health insurers out of the market and that's something that the trade agreements are designed to to forbid basically. Um, they also in terms of health stop new public programs being established um, if they in any way interfere with the operation of the global market. Uh, and uh, so as I said earlier all of these are part of what we would describe as a neoliberal agenda uh, which uh, corresponds uh, uh, to also the work of uh, the uh, international agencies, the IMF and the World Bank in particular, and their implementation of what's described as the Washington Consensus or structural adjustment, um, 
uh, many developing countries, but in respect of Canada, also us as well, because they do monitor what Canada does. So there's some of the architects of the neoliberal trade regime. Um, one thing that I would mention is that uh, there was a kind of confluence of different issues in the 1980s which enabled this to emerge. Uh, uh, you had, uh, on the one hand, uh, four major uh, political leaders, Reagan, Mulroney, Helmut Kohl, and Margaret Thatcher, all coming uh, into office in the 1980s and all sharing uh, essentially a very neoliberal view of how the uh, problems of the global economy should be addressed uh, during that period. Uh, and uh, this uh, convergence of these uh, various uh, conservative politicians at the same time globally uh, facilitated uh, dramatic changes in the way in which uh, they felt the global economy should be uh, managed. Um, so, um, let me just outline some of the issues which they were implementing domestically in their various uh, countries, but also which they pushed globally. Um, these agreements, uh, international agreements, uh, basically have been forcing governments to restructure uh, their economic uh, approach, including deregulation, privatization, lower taxes, smaller government, open markets, including uh, health service markets. Um, and the, the assumption is that, um, that um, governments are essentially the bad guys, uh, that uh, what we need to do is free corporations from uh, government interference wherever that's possible, um, and uh, that uh, regulation of corporate activity is inherently bad because it interferes with uh, how the market functions. Um, the assumptions here are ones that I think need to be looked at. Um, and I would argue quite strongly that uh, these agreements are based on ideology and not on evidence. Um, and why do I say that? Well, first, all of the trade agreements have the assumption that trade liberalization, to use another um, fashionable term, is essentially a one-way street. That is, once a program or a service is moved into the market, it cannot be returned to the public sphere. Once governments deregulate, they cannot reverse the decision, and there need to be sanctions to prevent them from doing so, international sanctions uh, imposed on them to stop them from doing that. So when a, a public enterprise or public service is privatized, it has to remain private. Um, and I would argue that this is very ideological, because the assumption is that in every situation, in every case, in every instance, markets are always better than governments, uh, and that public programs are always inferior to programs provided through the market. Now, why do I say this is ideological? Well, because the evidence is the other way in many cases. That doesn't mean that markets don't work successfully in many, many areas of our economy. Uh, they do. But there are many areas of the economy as well where it's quite clear that uh, government provision of services actually is quite successful. And uh, the assumption that we want to ratchet, like reduce the role of uh, governments in some of these key areas, I think is uh, fundamentally mistaken. And it conflicts with the evidence that we've got. Now, um, the uh, what is the evidence? Well, let's have a look just south of the border. This is big picture. We know that the U.S. Uh, system is far more uh, reliant on uh, the private market than our healthcare system. We know that um, the uh, system in the United States is extremely inefficient. You have multiple, uh, literally hundreds of uh, uh, private hospital corporations. Uh, you have uh, uh, dozens of major private insurers. Um, you've got, uh, again, uh, dozens of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so you've got a, a essentially a, a private um, system uh, which has failed really to deliver the kinds of benefits that we've seen uh, as a result of publicly uh, run or dominated systems, particularly in Western Europe, but also to a significant degree in Canada. And we know that if we move to the American style of uh, health provision with uh, multiple private insurers, multiple hospital, hospital corporations, and so forth, 
that the consequence in terms of economic efficiency would be dire. We would be spending, as they are, closer to 18 or 19 percent of our GDP compared with our 10 to 11 percent, and in Europe, uh, countries spending even less than that. So the evidence there is that uh, single-payer public systems actually are very efficient rather than uh, private competitive insurance markets for uh, providing health insurance. And yet the assumption in these trade agreements is that we should all move towards private markets and private insurers because inherently private markets are better than governments. So that's why I say these agreements are very ideological um, uh, and uh, uh, I think that's a, a mistake uh, and I think it's also anti-evidence-based, anti-scientific. So how are these agreements enforced? Uh, uh, I mean, countries sign on to many international treaties, uh, some dealing with labor rights or human rights or the Paris uh, Treaty on the Environment. But we find that all those treaties have a big problem, namely that they're not well enforced. Uh, human rights uh, commitments that governments make are left to the national governments to enforce. There's no international sanction. There may be some... Um, what's the right term, some international pressure on countries from time to time to behave more responsibly. Uh, but by and large, uh, all of these kinds of treaties uh, depend on the goodwill of governments domestically to honor whatever commitments have been made. But trade agreements are different. Trade agreements are enforced by trade sanctions. That is penalties that can be imposed on the exports of countries that violate these agreements and these sanctions, these penalties are very uh, stringent, very tough uh, and designed to be so, so that countries will fall into line with whatever commitments have been made. Some of these agreements uh, are enforced by giving investors the right to sue governments and we'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, and another point I want to make, and I'll say this several more times before I'm done, Trade obligations through either NAFTA or the World Trade Organ Organization or through many of the bilateral free trade agreements or bilateral investment agreements that have been signed are only binding on governments. They're not binding on corporations. They're not binding on investors. As I said earlier, governments are seen as the only bad guys in this economic scenario and it's governments that must be disciplined. Uh, the free market rules should allow corporations or investors basically to do whatever they see as being profitable. Uh, and so that's one of the fundamental problems that we see with this uh, emerging neoliberal uh, trade and uh, investment uh, regime. So I want to talk a bit about Canada. This may seem slightly remote initially from global health, but I think it will provide you with some insights into the problems that other countries are also facing, particularly developing countries. Um, after a very uh, tumultuous election in 1988, in which uh, many Canadians uh, indicated their opposition to a free trade agreement with the United States, um, Canada signed uh, the agreement because uh, uh, Brian Mulroney's Conservative government, uh, through a plurality, uh, of uh, the votes, namely about 41 percent uh, of the votes uh, in Canada, uh, succeeded in uh, getting a parliamentary majority even though the two opposition parties, the major ones, the NDP and the Liberals, were dead against signing a free trade agreement and between the two of them they got considerably more votes than Mulroney's Conservative Party but because of our first past the post system he got the parliamentary majority and succeeded in implementing the agreement. The goal of the Canadian agreement with the U.S. was to create a more integrated North American market for goods, services, and investment. Um, and it dramatically expanded Canada's trade obligations way beyond uh, what was included in the earlier GATT agreement, which, as I mentioned, only dealt with trade in goods. So um, the Canada's free trade agreement uh, set a template for future trade agreements in many respects. It included, in a modest way in some areas, it included services, it included financial services, it included investment, it included energy in a major way, it included new disciplines on government purchasing, and new disciplines on can how Canada was able to operate its crown corporations, or, or as the U.S. referred to them, public monopolies with the uh, 
negative implications of that term. Um, the other thing that's really important to understand about the agreement is that um, the assumption is the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was essentially permanent. So it wasn't a deal that one government negotiated for its term that could be repealed easily by a subsequent government if it didn't work out. The assumption was that the agreement was uh, a permanent arrangement and Canada, uh, until, until Trump actually reopened the agreement, operated on that basis that once, once in place the agreement would obligate all future governments to the uh, particular commitments that, that uh, the government negotiating the agreement had made. Uh, and again, this is something that one has to think about in terms of the democratic process because really it doesn't matter if you elect a different government with a, a different set of policies, they're still obligated, subject to major trade sanctions, to honor what was earlier negotiated by the previous uh, government that entered into the agreement. So, um, just a little background again on Canada's agreement. This is the famous Shamrock Summit, 19, actually my uh, term there is wrong, it's 85, not 95, in which Brian Mulroney, Brian Mulroney uh, met with uh, Ronald Reagan in Quebec City and they agreed to start negotiations on Canada's uh, trade agreement. Interestingly, the uh, way in which this was packaged in Canada was that Canada was asking for the agreement. The reality was that this was part of what the U.S. wanted globally and not just in Canada and it had already started negotiations with other countries for free trade agreements to implement Reagan's uh, vision of the role in which the U.S. could take in terms of uh, orchestrating uh, a new trade regime uh, across the globe. Um, so this is one of the little cartoons that we uh, had in our book on free trade in 1988. Uh, as you can see, the poor beaver is not really doing all of that well. Uh, and uh, it looks like it's not actually an, a an arrow that's going to be uh, coming his way, but rather, or her way for that matter, uh, but rather something else from the U.S. Anyway, um, so uh, let me talk a bit more about the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement uh, for a couple more slides. Uh, I would argue that the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement really was a, provided an end to the somewhat limited social democratic experiment that Canada engaged in during the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and if you look at uh, public policy in Canada, since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, there has been no major uh, implementation of what we would describe as a social democratic uh, initiative or policy in Canada. We've seen no um, establishment of new crown corporations, like for example here in BC, BC Hydro, ICBC, Quebec Hydro, federally Air Canada, and so on and so on. There were literally hundreds of crown corporations at the federal and provincial level that were established in the period after World War II right through to the early 1980s. And all of these had some rationale as to what they would do uh, for the Canadian economy, given that it was a resource-dependent economy, given its uh, small size, and given the view that in many areas of the economy it was essential for government to step in and provide the investments through Crown Corporations normally to um, uh, bolster or support particular economic activities, particularly in the regions. Um, instead, we've seen a dramatic reduction in the size of uh, governments in Canada as a share of GDP uh, and also in the role of government in the economy. When Canada uh, signed the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, uh, the size of the public sector in Canada was more than a third larger than the United States. Um, and the public sector was very different in Canada because uh, Canada relied far less on military spending as part of its public sector. Uh, so since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, uh, uh, we've seen extensive privatization of literally hundreds of public enterprises and services at the federal and provincial levels. And we've seen uh, uh, a uh, treading backward, essentially, in our social safety net, as many uh, government programs have been reduced or eliminated. If you think about public housing, uh, you can think about the fact that we've uh, not moved forward in terms of a PharmaCare plan and, and may not, if we're unlucky, move forward on that uh, and we'll probably face trade sanctions if we try and do that in any event. 
Um, many other areas where arguably like unemployment insurance things were far more generous uh, 30 or 40 years ago than they are today. So the social safety net in Canada has moved backwards very significantly since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was negotiated. And by the way, this was not what was promised. We were promised that things were going to get much better because the economy would be so um, effective in generating uh, higher uh, GDP per capita and so much more efficient and prosperous that there would be ample money to pay for even more social programs. This never happened. So um, let's talk about the North American Free Trade Agreement. Canada was promised a special deal uh, with the uh, Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, but no sooner was the ink dry than the US announced it was negotiating with Mexico. Not surprising, really. And Mex Mexico, um, from the US's point of view, was a very important uh, expansion of its deal because uh, there were uh, significant investor opportunities in Mexico that its corporations wanted to take advantage of. Um, and Canada joined, uh, perhaps initially reluctantly, because it thought that there would be special privileges, and I use that in quotation marks, that Canada had got uh, in its deal with the U.S. that suddenly would be undermined by the new deal with Mexico. Now, the NAFTA agreement is far more comprehensive than the earlier Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. Many of the uh, relatively small provisions in the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement were expanded into complete chapters in NAFTA. The most important from the health perspective, uh, and the most important also in terms of uh, its impact on global health, was that it contained a, a brand new chapter on intellectual property, which locked in 20-year patent protection for drugs in Canada. It also included new chapters in the areas of services, including health services, uh, financial services, crown corporations, energy, government purchasing, uh, and a range of other areas as well. Um, one of the other major chapters was a whole chapter on investment, which uh, provided U.S. and Mexican investors the ability to challenge government policy on decisions that would adversely affect their investments. It applied to all investments, including the health sector. Uh, and while the Canadian government put in place some reservations to try and shelter uh, uh, Canada's health care system, uh, and particularly its health insurance arrangements, from the impact of uh, the new obligations under NAFTA. And nonetheless, the uh, investment chapter in principle applied to everything, uh, and there was no effective uh, or no comprehensive limit, particularly with respect to any investment areas that were not already part of the Canadian uh, health care system. Um, so, the basic principle here, uh, that uh, if I can reinforce my point, is that uh, health should be provided, health care should be provided through the market and not through government. Now historically, of course, Canadians have taken the opposite view. The market has failed in many cases. That's why we got our current Medicare system, incomplete as it is. Um, and uh, particularly the assumption that insurance should be public and single payer is a fundamental part of our Medicare system that Canadians strongly support. And also the idea that at the point of delivery of health services, we should be um, uh, ensuring that uh, health services uh, do not impose user fees or charges so that people have full access, unimpeded by worries about whether they can pay. At the time, of course, the negotiators realized that Canada's system was in some respects uh, in contradiction to the principles of NAFTA. And so to avoid the uh, potential conflicts that could arise here, and particularly to get the agreement uh, locked into place, uh, the Canadian government um, put in, in place a, a variety of what are called grandparenting provisions. The assumption was that we could keep what we had but we couldn't expand it. We couldn't uh, uh, create a new public health care programs that would fly in the face of the uh, restrictions that were imposed uh, in terms of investor rights and in terms of the uh, assumption that the market should be providing health services. And below that was the understanding that in the long term the vision should be 
to move towards a more U.S. style healthcare system in which the market would play a much greater role in providing health services. Um, so, what else about the North American Free Trade Agreement that's relevant here? Um, NAFTA uh, included these provisions to maintain uh, non-conforming policies in health and social services, uh, but uh, there were real limits to the extent of this uh, and uh, still debates about the extent to which uh, these uh, grandparenting provisions are, are uh, effective or, or provide adequate protection for the system we currently have. But the main point, just to uh, re uh, reiterate what I said earlier, is that new public health system uh, are going to be subject to potential trade uh, sanctions uh, if they compete, compete with U.S. Uh, commercial services in the healthcare sector. And this is a huge deterrent uh, to Canada expanding uh, its healthcare system into areas where many people feel they should now apply. Uh, and uh, to re reinforce another point I made, the ratchet principle uh, is in place as well. The assumption that once something is privatized, it can never go back into the public sector, or once a service is provided commercially, it cannot be expropriated or uh, you cannot put in place a new public program to take it over. There's our little uh, cartoon again. So, um, I want to talk a bit more about the intellectual property uh, provisions in NAFTA because they again are ones that apply globally and, and the message I guess is very much the same. Um, Chapter 17 of NAFTA is uh, a chapter that reads almost identically to the TRIPS agreement which you've been hearing about in the video of um, um, Peter Drahos. Uh, and uh, it provides a minimum 20-year protection for patents and in fact uh, the way things have worked out it's actually more than that uh, due to various bells and whist whistles that the pharmaceutical industry has managed to include in our legislation. Um, Canada's law, its, it's uh, pharmaceutical uh, legislation, uh, has to conform with its NAFTA obligations. And when NAFTA was first implemented, there was a mass of like thousands and thousands of pages of Canadian legislation had to be amended so that every uh, provision of NAFTA was fully incorporated into Canadian law. Um, so why are patents so important here? Why is NAFTA important here? Well. Obviously, they apply to the cost of drugs uh, and the availability of drugs because they provide a private monopoly to the patent holder. Uh, and uh, these uh, private monopolies have uh, resulted, as many of you are aware, in a huge increase in the share of uh, drug uh, expenditures in Canada. If you go back to the early 80s, uh, about 8% of our total health expenditures were for pharmaceuticals. Now, we spend uh, roughly double that. We spend about 16% of our total health expenditures on pharmaceuticals. Not all of this is related to patent protection. Some of it has to do with uh, increasing uh, prescription of drugs. But patent protection has made a major impact in terms of uh, the cost of drugs. And we're seeing more and more the cost of new drugs, the biologics, which are protected by patents, uh, uh, taking a larger and larger share of our total drug expenditure. There we are. Poor little beavers had a hard time. So, um, compulsory licensing. Some background here again, a little bit Canadian, but I think relevant. Um, and a story you probably don't know and should know. Um, in 1969, we amended uh, our um, compulsory licensing legislation in our Patent Act. Um, and uh, Basically, the change was to allow Canadian generic companies to import the ingredients uh, used in making a, a, a drug, and that meant that they could uh, then start copying and producing um, uh, drugs that were otherwise under patent by the big pharmaceutical companies, who were the dominant players in terms of producing drugs in Canada. In fact, there was very little domestic pharmaceutical manufacturing outside of that done by the multinational companies. Uh, and this was a big issue in Canada in the 1960s. So how did this work? Well, uh, as a result of this 1969 amendment, generic companies based in Canada could produce a copy of a patented drug, and what they had to do was pay the royalty 
a royalty to the patent holders amounting to 4% of the sale price. That was it. Um, and uh, so this created a huge incentive for the creation of a lot of new generic companies in Canada, companies like Apotex and so on have benefited from this. Um, and at the same time, it resulted in stopping the rise in drug expenditures in Canada and uh, by the 80s was saving Canadians hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, which otherwise would have been uh, given to the multinational drug companies had the patent uh, legislation not be amended. One of the U.S. conditions of going into NAFTA was to abandon this, and Canada did this uh, in two um, uh, pieces of legislation. Um, uh, one was uh, Bill C-22 in 1987, and then B Bill C-91 in 1993. Uh, and of course it was denied by governments that there was any connection with uh, getting rid of compulsory licensing in NAFTA or earlier the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement. But there was no question in the U.S. mind that this was one of the components of the deal that they wanted and that the Mulroney government gave them. So that's drugs, very important, uh, and uh, some background that you may not know. In terms of investment, um, as I mentioned before, the GATT agreement did not cover uh, investment at all. Um, but, uh, and nor did it cover services, it only covered goods. So the NAFTA investment chapter uh, was new and, and for the U.S. was a huge uh, advantage because it gave protection to all of their companies uh, that had investments in Canada. Um, the uh, uh, impact was to uh, place limits on uh, government policies that would adversely affect the value or the profitability of U.S. and theoretically Mexican, although that wasn't that important, of U.S. investors uh, and their investments in Canada. Uh, and this applied not only to when a government would nationalize a, a, a private company, but also when it put in place regulations or policies that would adversely affect the anticipated rate of return or the, the uh, actual um, value of the company operating in Canada. And the sort of weasel words that were used here were terms called tantamount to expropriation. And this gave investors the right to sue governments uh, for any potential losses. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few um, illustrations of this, but the point I want to make that's really important, it's not so much how many lawsuits we've seen, although there have been quite a number. The point is that this impacts, uh, this imposes a chilling effect on governments. If you know that a new policy that you put in place in regulating, uh, say, the forest industry or the mining industry or the oil and gas industry would have the effect of adversely affecting their profitability and that it would expose you to an after challenge, which you would probably lose, the uh, response of many governments is simply to avoid going down that path. Uh, there's lots of public policy issues they can pursue uh, and uh, they don't need to pursue uh, policies where they have a high chance of losing a trade challenge. So what this does is take these issues off the policy agenda. Uh, this is what's referred to as the chilling effect. That is to say, if you think you're likely to be sued, then just don't bother to go down that road. Uh, there, as I said, there's lots of other policies you can pursue. Uh, and uh, the fact that you might have good policy reasons for uh, a regulation uh, is not anymore the uh, rationale for doing it because the real rationale is, is that uh, you're afraid of uh, being sued and therefore you avoid uh, getting involved in that kind of uh, issue. So we don't know and have no way of measuring the extent of the chilling effect on uh, Canadian government policy, but my view is it's very extensive. Um, and I did work in the trade policy uh, division of the BC government for a couple of years uh, back in the 90s when NAFTA was being implemented. So I think I have some background there that, uh, uh, in terms of my experience, uh, suggests that. So uh, there have been lots of investor lawsuits, uh, and uh, I've got a screenshot here of a uh, recent uh, publication by the CCPA, Scott Sinclair, who I worked with actually in the BC government years ago, um, looking at uh, investor state disputes in Canada under Chapter 11, uh, and you can go, you can Google that and uh, read that if you're interested uh, after the course is over. Um, 
And uh, here is uh, a uh, look at some of the disputes. These are all NAFTA disputes uh, in which they've challenged various kinds of measures enacted by governments. And you can see at the top, in environmental protection and resource management uh, are key uh, areas where uh, investors have been suing governments. Uh, and the reason is obvious that when you put in place new environmental regulations uh, that can impose costs on companies, and basically they want uh, the governments to pay that or to make them whole and prevent any additional cost to the investors for these uh, regulations. Um, and resource management, again, same area. Uh, and then you see as well the fourth uh, bar there down. Um, there have been a number of lawsuits around healthcare and pharmaceuticals, and I'll show you a couple in a few minutes. Um, so uh, you can find out more about this, uh, the number of uh, NAFTA Chapter 11 uh, investment disputes uh, uh, at Global Affairs Canada, and this is a screenshot of listing some of them uh, that are ongoing, and I'm just going to show you a couple as well. Uh, one of the first uh, NAFTA disputes uh, occurred uh, with Mexico, actually, around a uh, toxic waste uh, dump. Uh, an American company bought the Mexican company uh, that owned the site. Uh, the site uh, was leaching uh, toxic chemicals into the local groundwater. The people in the community were really upset that if more toxics were dumped into this waste site that uh, their groundwater would be totally poisoned. So they said uh, before the U.S. company could uh, make use of the site, it would have to uh, clean up the existing site and make sure that there was no uh, toxic chemicals leaching into the groundwater. The U.S. company said, sorry, that's not uh, what we plan to do. We just uh, plan to reopen the site. That's what we were uh, allowed to do, uh, basically, uh, uh, by buying this company, which uh, had the, the Mexican company, which had the right to keep it open if it wanted. Uh, and uh, so when the local government said, no, you can't do that, our bylaws prevent it, uh, and when the state government supported the local government in that decision, uh, Metalcloud, the U.S. company involved who bought the site, uh, filed an after Chapter 11 uh, uh, claim against the Mexican government, and the Mexican government is the party to NAFTA, so it's the, the entity that gets sued. And the outcome of that was that uh, Metalcloud won, uh, and Mexico paid a, a small compensation to Metalcloud. I think it was about $13 million. But the message was pretty clear uh, that uh, if new regulations environmentally were put in place in Mexico, it was the Mexican government that was on the hook to pay. Uh, uh, a case in Canada was the Ethel Corporation Canada uh, dispute. Uh, this is one of the worst of these NAFTA disputes. Uh, and what was this about? Well, um, Ethel Corporation uh, decided to ban an additive to gasoline called MMT, and there was lots of evidence that it was linked to cancer, and the government uh, legislated accordingly. Um, but the U.S. Uh, chemicals company Ethel didn't want this to happen because uh, it was also selling ethyl, um, its uh, additive, sorry, MMT, to various other countries, and it was used in the U.S. as well. So a Canadian ban would send the wrong signal in terms of its future markets. Uh, and so it sued Canada under Chapter 11, uh, and it said that the ban, and remember this is a regulatory matter, this is not expropriation, it said the ban constituted an expropriation of its assets, or a decision tantamount to expropriation, and also an attack on its reputation as a good company. Uh, Canada capitulated on this after the NAFTA panel was set up, and in June 1998, it, would, it withdrew the environmental legislation, uh, and this was independent of whether there was still evidence that uh, MMT caused cancer, uh, and then it issued a public apology, a letter actually, to Ethel, and it gave the company $13 million in compensation. So this is how we responded, and why? Well, because um, the NAFTA panel that would be set up to deal with this is not interested in the public health issue, it's interested in the narrow issue of whether this constituted an expropriation of uh, the company's MMT, and it would have decided accordingly, and uh, that was it. So, um, another much more recent one, Abitibi versus uh, uh, Newfoundland. Um, short history here, 
Um, years and years ago, Newfoundland gave the Pulp and Paper Company, Abitibi, which is a Canadian company, by the way, um, the water for uh, a power for for power development rights. That is to say, to build a dam and use the electricity generated by the dam to run a, a pulp and paper mill and a lumber mill. Uh, and uh, the uh, lumber mill then would generate uh, economic activity in the whole region, uh, in the forest sector, uh, and as well jobs at the mill. So this is the deal, basically. The Newfoundland government gave the company the water rights to build a dam and generate electricity for the mill. Um, the company uh, went actually went... Uh, uh, on the verge of bankruptcy. I'm not sure if it fully went bankrupt, but anyway, it had ran into hard times, uh, uh, decided that uh, what it needed to do was get rid of its uh, mill and shut it down. That ended the uh, forest sector in the region, uh, but it still had the power plant, the dam, and it wanted to continue to sell the electricity generated uh, from the dam uh, to the Newfoundland power grid and make uh, ongoing revenue indefinitely into the future for the uh, water uh, rights that were earlier given to it on condition that uh, it used the water rights uh, and the electricity to power the mill. So the Newfoundland government said, sorry, that's not uh, what the deal was. The deal was you were to keep these jobs and you didn't. So we're not going to allow you to um, uh, sell, the sell the electricity to the Newfoundland power grid. What we are going to do is purchase at its existing value the dam uh, and uh, we're going to then give you that compensation but nothing more because you're not going to have an endless revenue stream of selling electricity to our grid from our water. Um, the Abitibi Bowater set up a, a subsidiary in uh, Delaware. The Delaware subsidiary then sued because it was formerly a US company, sued uh, Canada and the uh, Harper government settled the deal by giving the company uh, $130 million uh, and also told all provinces that if they did anything like what Newfoundland was doing, uh, that it would make sure that they paid all of the costs of any uh, future uh, uh, arbitration settlement uh, coming out of a NAFTA, NAFTA claim. Uh, I'll go through another of these lawsuits quickly, but they're all environmental uh, that are important. Uh, uh, a big one that's still uh, unresolved in Quebec is the anti-fracking legislation that the Quebec government passed due to public concern about the water table in the St. Lawrence or in the area around the St. Lawrence River uh, and uh, what fracking might do to poison it. Uh, so uh, there was a, a first what happened is that an earlier Quebec government gave out uh, the uh, drilling rights to uh, uh, this company and, um, and uh, the company started drilling. Uh, then a, a subsequent government uh, said Lone Pine had to stop drilling uh, because uh, of the potential danger to the water uh, table. Uh, and uh, Lone Pine then filed a, a NAFTA lawsuit. And that's been in the um, NAFTA arbitration system for a long, long time. But the company uh, has been asking for $120 million to uh, uh, take... Uh, to have the, the water rights, or sorry, the, the drilling rights uh, taken back, uh, which the province had uh, legislated uh, would happen. Um, now, let me just go on a quick diversion here because this applies to many countries, the same uh, idea. Uh, think about what it would mean in BC if, for example, the drilling rights that our province has given, on which it's received a number of billions of dollars, were to be um, rescinded uh, because we decided to stop fracking. Uh, the NAFTA challenge here, uh, under the current NAFTA agreement anyway, would be very, very substantial. Uh, and uh, this would be something that uh, obviously would have a chilling effect on the BC government's uh, appetite for doing anything to stop the fracking permits that have already been uh, awarded to private companies under the previous government. Um, so, uh, some pictures of uh, Lone Pine uh, uh, fracking ban from the uh, Quebec uh, uh, papers. Uh, another one, uh, Newfoundland, the same thing. Exxon Murphy got a $17 million settlement for a policy change on the Newfoundland government. Um, 
and then uh, Eli Lilly sued in this case unsuccessfully after uh, a dispute around uh, the Health Canada's refusal to um, approve a new uh, so-called new Me Too drug saying that there was no basic uh, improvement over existing ones and that there was no justification for giving it a new patent. Um, and uh, Lilly eventually, after losing three times in our courts, took it to an NAFTA tribunal, which um, fortunately said, no, you don't have a case. So they don't win all of them, but they win a lot of them. Okay, I want to look at one more, uh, something you're probably not aware of, uh, but a major lawsuit that had a huge impact on health in Canada. Um, in the late 1980s, um, Canadian health experts concluded that one way to reduce smoking would be to require companies to package cigarettes in plain wrappers, that is, plain packaging. In 1992, the Canadian government announced it would legislate plain, plain packaging. The U.S. controlled cigarette industry was not happy at all. Uh, both because of the revenue loss in Canada, but also because of the signal to the rest of the world. Uh, in 1980, 90, sorry, 1994, NAFTA came into force, including the new chapter on intellectual property. And this contained a provision dealing with trademarks. Now, trademarks, what does that have to do with uh, wrappers on uh, cigarettes? Well, those are trademarks. Marlboro, you know, the Marlboro Man, Viceroy, Players, all of these cigarette uh, packages uh, are linked with their image to advertising campaigns. And uh, so if you take away the ability of the company to use its uh, image, uh, effectively what you're doing is reducing the value of the company because, for example, when a company is sold, uh, if you think about, say, Coca-Cola were being sold, uh, the value of Coca-Cola is not just the physical uh, plant or, or whatever property it owns physically and so on, uh, whatever um, money it would have in the bank and so on. No, the value of Coca-Cola is actually the Coca-Cola image, which is on Coke bottles and in many other places. That's the value of the company. And many companies, when they're sold, um, they, they um, attribute uh, a significant amount of their value to the intellectual property of their trademarks. So this is the basis on which uh, the uh, uh, U.S. cigarette industry sued Canada. Um, and uh, Carla Hills and her um, assistant, Julia Katz, were the two chief negotiators for the U.S. government um, when NAFTA was being put together in the early um, 1990s. Um, Carla Hills uh, and Julius Katz then uh, left government, left the U.S. government, and went into private law practice. And uh, R.J. Reynolds, a major tobacco company, U.S. tobacco company, then hired their law firm and specifically got Hills and Katz to write a legal opinion uh, to be presented to the Canadian Parliamentary Committee that was dealing with uh, plain packaging to tell Canada that if it forced companies to use plain packaging, this constituted expropriation of their trademark assets. It was a direct violation of NAFTA and also uh, another, um, uh, a couple of other agreements as well, but NAFTA was the central one. Um, and uh, that Canada would uh, be subject to a major lawsuit, which it would lose. Um, and so the Canadian government backed down uh, and cancelled the legislation. And we uh, basically went for more than 20 years without plain packaging until the Australian government, due to changes basically in our understanding of the harm health of cigarettes, was success successfully put in place uh, plain packaging despite several WTO challenges uh, to its legislation three or four years ago. But what I want to say is that we could have had plain packaging uh, in around 1994 or 95, and how many people might have not started smoking or might have stopped smoking as a result of that? Well, we don't have a number, but my guess is many thousands of people unnecessarily died of lung cancer because we were not able to put in place this um, policy tool of plain packaging, and that was directly because of losing this, or, or losing, so of 
facing the threat of loss of an after lawsuit. Now I'm going to show you the letter that was uh, sent. This is um, to the Standing Committee on Health, House of Commons Canada on Plain Packaging, submission of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company, the U.S. Tobacco Company, uh, and they uh, included a number of uh, appendices to this. Uh, this is the letter from R.J. Reynolds, uh, and it outlines uh, some of its uh, tobacco um, sub subsidiaries and so on who would be affected by plain packaging. Uh, and uh, you can read that uh, um, uh, if you have some time. It's in the, the PowerPoint as well. It'll be posted separately. Uh, but I want you to see what's on the last page of this uh, letter. It says, uh, plain packaging legislation would violate Canada's obligations under NAFTA, GATT, and the Paris Convention on Intellectual Property. Plain packaging legislation would be an unlawful expropriation of trademarks and investments uh, and which for which proper and full compensation in the hundreds of millions of dollars would have to be paid. So that's the threat that was made to Canada and the threat that succeeded in a, us abandoning our plain packaging legislation. Um, so let me broaden this out now to look at uh, other countries. Um, NAFTA uh, was promoted in Canada and also in Mexico and the U.S. as being a way to enable Mexico to move from a um, relatively uh, poor developing country into um, a situation where it would become a sort of a mid-level country, uh, would uh, have its economy dramatically improved as a result of uh, the uh, integration with the U.S. Uh, market. Uh, and new uh, U.S. investment in uh, uh, Mexican industry and also uh, this would raise wages and uh, uh, ensure that Mexico was uh, uh, basically much more prosperous over time. And there was just a lot of hype about this. We were uh, in, engaged in negotiating with um, uh, the U.S. and Mexico because we were going to help improve the situation of ordinary people in Mexico as a result of the benefits of NAFTA. Um, and uh, so some of those benefits are listed in the slide, I won't say more, but um, what happened in fact? Well first Mexico had to change its constitution to open the door to privatization and foreign ownership of land. Uh, there had been from its uh, earlier constitution a commitment um, that uh, uh, much of the land that was agricultural uh, was owned collectively. Um, I don't speak Spanish, but the term is Yeshudos, and uh, that was in the Constitution, and that basically forbade private ownership of much of the agricultural land in Mexico. Uh, so the Constitution had to be changed, and that happened. Salinas, who was the president at the time, made that arrangement. Um, but also Mexico had to end tariffs on key food items now, previous to NAFTA, Mexico was basically self-sufficient in food, and there's no question that much of the agriculture was very basic, very inefficient in a way, but it provided um, a, um, a subsistence living for literally millions and millions of Mexican farmers. Um, and uh, the key staples were corn, rice, and beans, uh, and these were uh, products that the U.S. in particular uh, was, uh, had a huge surplus uh, of, and wanted to sell into the Mexican market. Um, since the agreement uh, was implemented in uh, 1995, uh, Mexico uh, dropped its tariffs on all these food items, and now uh, over 35 percent uh, of Mexican uh, corn uh, and other foodstuffs are now being imported from the U.S. Why is that? Because the U.S. government uh, is uh, hugely subsidizing its uh, Midwestern and Southern farmers to produce these various uh, food items. And so they're dumping these items into the Mexican um, economy at below the real cost of production uh, and uh, forcing literally millions of Mexican farmers off the land into the cities. And what's that meant? Well, there's been a huge influx of uh, very, very poor people desperate for work into the cities, hence wages have not risen since 1994, and you can check the numbers on that. Uh, um, at the same time, uh, the um, uh, diet of Mexicans has been 
dramatically changed. Uh, as a result of the investments made uh, both by the agribusiness industry in Mexico and the um, way in which uh, the U.S. fast food industry and uh, processed food industry have also moved into Mexico uh, selling their products uh, to uh, Mexicans, uh, particularly in the urban areas. Uh, and so the diet of Mexicans has changed dramatically uh, uh, as uh, the uh, McDonald's and Burger Kings and so on, as well as all the processed foods, which are high fat, high sugar, so on, uh, have been, uh, uh, have expanded in terms of sales in the Mexican economy. And also the sale of soda, which is uh, uh, produced uh, using corn syrup, uh, largely from the United States. Uh, and uh, that too has been a major contributing factor uh, my niece uh, has uh, is her, her father uh, married a Mexican woman and she spent part of her life uh, growing up in Mexico and she told me that it's cheaper to buy coke than it is to buy water and lots of kids in Mexico unbelievably are uh, drinking coke uh, for uh, instead of water uh, because for the parents it's actually cheaper uh, and the impact long term on their health is going to be um, really terrible. The, the rate of, of obesity in Mexico now is similar to that of the U.S. and the uh, long-term impact in terms of diabetes will likely be very similar as well. At the same time, Mexican inequality has not gone down. Uh, one of the richest people in the world, Carlos Slim, uh, is I think he's about number eight or ten. It varies a little bit depending on the dot-com situation in uh, San Francisco who has more money. Uh, the uh, head of Facebook and the head of, uh, of um, various other dot-com companies uh, skyrocketed in terms of their money, but Carlos Slim um, is probably the fourth or fifth richest person in the world. Much of his wealth has come since NAFTA and much of it is a result of the privatization of the phone system in Mexico. So we have not seen uh, the benefits to Mexico that were all promised uh, and which are still being uh, touted by, uh, unfortunately, our government uh, as why uh, NAFTA has uh, benefited Mexico. Um, so I talked a little bit about what happened to farmers in Mexico and the social disruption. Some people also think that because of the uh, way in which it's forced so many, uh, especially peasants, uh, off the land and, and also kept wages suppressed, that this has really opened the door, combined with the U.S. obsession, unfortunately, with the war on drugs and its subsidization of the, uh, the Mexican military to carry out the war, that um, this has been a major uh, contributing factor, not the only one, but a contributing factor to the terrible situation they've got now with the uh, drug-related murders in Mexico. Um, um, thousands of people every month being killed, and more this year than last year. Okay, I'm going to move now. I'm going to shift uh, to the World Trade Organization uh, and uh, uh, talk a bit about that. But uh, before doing that, I think I'm going to stop this video and uh, start a second video uh, to give you uh, some background on that. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I hope that this has been informative. I hope I'm not too boring as well. Take care. We'll see you in the second